question. Yeah. I have a question from last week's teaching and, okay. and it was regarding something that you stated about uh, how long a prophet would have studied Torah um, during the reign of a, of a certain kings. And so my question was, what, well, you had mentioned that there, depending on the amount of Torah that they had studied would be the length of what they would have prophesied. So here's my question. If the kings were sinful and involved in idolatry and they didn't study Torah themselves, or wrote their own Torah to even study it, would that then make the prophet greater than the king at that point? Uh, yes, in fact, if, if you were to um, read the Book of Kings more than once, you would notice that the, uh, well, of course, the star of any book in Tanakh is, is Hashem, but uh, it's God, it's God, but um, the, the uh, main characters are, the prophets, not the kings. Okay. Okay. The kings are are oftentimes the um, uh, the, the uh, in many cases the villain <laughs> who faces the, the prophet. Okay. Um, so we find that the uh, the Book of Kings focuses more on the the kings of of uh, the north. Then, for example, the book of uh, Chronicles. The book of Chronicles is, is almost exclusively about the kings of Judah. Okay. Uh, so it, when you're discussing the kings of the north, uh, there was a couple kings who were only bad half of the time, <laughs> unfortunately. And um, so that means that um, any the human who's going to be the uh, the uh, hero of that story will be the prophet, not not the king. Okay. So it's it's um, it's, uh, it's really fascinating, you know. Just um, if you if, if it's been a long time since you read the Book of Kings or uh, you haven't fully covered it, try to read it uh, cover to cover, both books, and then you'll see that it's really the the prophets that are the the stars of the show. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. I will go visit, revisit that. It's been a while. Uh, thanks for having mercy on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Oh, very well. Good question. And of course, any um, uh, in-depth question, in, in question that you have um, between classes, you could always write me, rabbifriedlander at gmail.com, or ask in class at the next class, just like uh, Mercy did uh, just now. Thank you. Okay, so we left off at the end of chapter one of Amos. Starting chapter two of Amos. I'll be reading from the uh, Art Scroll Milstein edition. Within the book of the 12 prophets is the story of Amos. Okay, so we left off at the end of chapter one, discussing the, the children of Ammon. Uh, Ammon was the brother of Moab. Now we'll discuss the, uh, the uh, people of Moab. And then um, we're going to start talking about Israel. Okay, chapter two is 16 verses. So I will read the Hebrew and we'll need a volunteer uh, to read the English. Do we have any volunteers to cover chapter two? Uh, please translate only from a Masoretic text. As we mentioned uh, numerous times, Masoretic text means a first generation translation from the original Hebrew, uh, whereas um, any other kind of Bible is usually at best no less than three generations. Uh, translation from the uh, from the Latin translation from the Greek translation from the Hebrew. So 
leaves more um, potential for error. And invariably there are errors, except in the Hebrew text, which uh, literally people give their lives uh, to preserve the original uh, Hebrew letters. Even, even one single letter change would be uh, considered catastrophic. So people have died to keep uh, the original Hebrew text accurate. So therefore you want as, as few generations between the, the original Hebrew and the language that you're reading uh, to occur. So any translation of the original Hebrew is a first, uh, first generation translation, even if it's written in the 21st century. Okay, um, can we have a volunteer for the English uh, and then I'll do the Hebrew? Volunteer to read the English. Uh, remember to unmute if you're, you're trying to say something and uh, if, you, if you don't unmute, uh, your, your phone is hearing you but the rest of us uh, may not be hearing you. God, of course, hears you, so you're getting like credit from heaven. But as far as communicating with the rest of us, it's like uh, we, we're not fully aware. As it says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 28, uh, hidden things are for the Lord our God, and the revealed things are for us and our children to do all the words of this Torah. Therefore, if you don't let us know, how can we guess? Uh, that's in the purview of God in such matters. I'll read if you like me to, Rabbi. Ooh, okay, we got we got a, <laughs> all right, volunteer. That's pretty good. Okay. Okay, so first I'll read the Hebrew, and then uh, so that's original um, original uh, enunciation of the prophecy. Uh, although, of course, I'm using an Ashkenazic version of, of pronunciation. And then, um, then we'll have a first generation translation. Cool. Uh, if you are not using the um, Art Scroll translation, please mention which translation you're using so we know uh, what's going on. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. Al Sorfo Atmos Malach Edom La Sid. Bishilachi Aish Bumoab, Vachla Armenos Karios, Umes Bishaon Moab, Bisrua Bakol Shafar, the Hirati Shall Faith Mikirba, the Holza Reha Herub Imo, Amar Denoi, Komar Denoi, Al Shoshan Pish E. Hudaval Arba La Shibenu, Am Asam Estoras Adonai Hukav, Lo Shamaru. Bayas um kizvehem asher haluchu avosam acharehem v'shilachti eisht Yehuda v'achla armenos v'shilayim. Okay, and then continuing in the original Hebrew and starting starting in verse uh, six begins the half Torah part for the uh, Torah portion of Vayeshev. Uh, that's the Torah portion in which uh, Joseph is sold. Uh, so, and so this this following uh, chapter and into the next chapter has some correlation to that um, uh, to that uh, Torah portion. Komar Donal Shalosha Pishay Yisrael Vala Bar Lashi Venu Amichram Bakesef Sadik Vavion Bavur Na Loim Ashuafim Alafar Eretz Rosh Dalim, the Derch Anavim Yatu, the Ish of Vaviv Yelhu, El Hanara, the Man Halil Es Shem Kachi Al Val Habagadim Havluli, Havulim Yatu Etzel Komizbeach, Vien Anushim Ish to Base Elohim, Benochi Hishmati Es Hamori Mipaneham, Asher Kugova Arazim. Gavho Bachasom, Hu Ka Kaalo Kaaloni, Vashmid Pirio Mimal Shoshav Mitochas, Vonoche Halesi Esachem, May Eretz Mitzrayim, Volech Esachem Bamidbar Arba Shanim, Arboim Shana, Loreshes Es Eretz Hamori, Vakim Mi Benechem, Lenevim, Mi Bab Mi Ba. Hurechem Linazirim Aaf in Zos Benesrel Nu Madanoi 
Vatashku eshan hanazirim yoin val hanavim tivisem. Le mor lo tinabu. Hine nochi me me ik tachtechem. Kasher ta ik agala hamalaya la amir. Vavad manos me call vachazak lo ya amates koho. The gibor lo ya malet nafsho. So face hakeshes. Lo yamu, bekal barag lav lo yimaleit, berochiv hasus lo yimaleit nafsho. Ba'mitz libo ba'giborim, arom yanus ba'yomahu yom adonai. Okay, Mercy, can you please translate uh, the first chapter, the second chapter of Amos? And uh, are you using art scroll? I am. Yes. Okay. Thus said Hashem. For the three transgressions of Moab, I have looked away, but for four, I will not pardon them. For their burning the bones of the king of Edom into lime, I will send fire into Moab, and it will consume the places, palaces of Kerioth, and Moab will die in a tumult amidst trumpeting and the sound of the shofar. I will eliminate any judge from its midst, and I will kill all of its officers along with them," said Hashem. Uh, Thus, let's pause for, uh, can I may, may I ask you to pause? Okay. Okay. And um, uh, so uh, then, now we just read last week in the end of the, the previous chapter about the children of Ammon. Now this is Moab. Now next we're going to discuss uh, Judah. And then uh, Israel referring to the Northern Kingdom. So why is Amon, Moab mentioned closer to Israel than Ammon? Both of them had great righteous uh, women come from that. Yeah, of course, Moab had uh, Ruth and Ammon had uh, Nama, the, the wife of King Solomon. Uh, Nama, uh, the wife of King Solomon, uh, the uh, the uh, convert from Ammon, uh, she is the foremother of the uh, the um, the dynasty that came following uh, Solomon. So it means Hezekiah, Josiah, and and uh, Mashiach, or Messiah are all they're all going to uh, they're all descended from both Ruth and Nama. However, Ruth had uh, four extra generations of righteous people come fr from her. And Nama had, uh, starting from the generation after Solomon. Uh, so that means um, Oved, Yishai, David, and Shlomo, uh, those four incredibly righteous people, they came from Ruth. So be, because of those four righteous people, Moab deserves to be mentioned closer uh, to the uh, kingdom of priests. But it's, if you look in the original Hebrew, there's no reason to assume that this is a part of the same chapter as the, uh, as the rest of the chapter discusses uh, Israel. However, the proximity to the rest of the chapter is, is probably in the merit of those four extra righteous generations that came from Ruth. Uh, so this, this alludes to the fact that uh, in, in Judaism and Jewish thought, the forefathers and the, the founders of civilization are considered greater usually than, than the descendants, at least from a natural perspective. There, there could be people who rise to greatness, you know. So, uh, for example, King David rose to greatness um, beyond uh, many of, beyond the level of many who lived before him. Uh, but we're talking in general, we consider the previous generations at a higher level and the later generations at, at a naturally lower level unless they raise themselves up, spiritually speaking. So this is very different from the, the modern world where 
the latest craze, the latest uh, thing is obviously better than the previous thing. In Talmudic thought, that's only true if you're talking about an, an editor. If you have an edition that had mistakes, so you go according to the edition that had the latest edits, there's a good chance that they fixed something that had some mistakes. However, when you're comparing uh, people from different generations, we don't assume people from the past are, are you know, like, God forbid, like a Neanderthal compared to the modern people. The uh, people from the past have many more generations descended from them of righteous people. And a righteous person is, 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 is amazing because they, they help not only their, their descendants, they not only become a forefather of their, or a foremother of their descendants, but also they help their forebearers as well. So to, whenever you have generations and generations of righteous people, um, sometimes it may have been in merit of a, a minor thing that someone of a previous generation may have done, but they deserve to have uh, someone come from them. So the, the wicked king, uh, the father of Ruth, Eglon from, from Moab, uh, he was an uh, Id idolater, uh, 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 a bad person, except when he heard that there was a um, there was a message from God, a prophecy. He, even though he was extremely overweight, he forced himself to his feet to stand up in God's honor. And from that one good thing that he did, he merited to have Ruth come from him. Now, that means if he merited to have Ruth from him, he merited to have David, Solomon, Hezekiah, <laughs> Josiah, Mashiach come from him. Uh, also, great sages of the Talmud, of course, you know, like uh, Ramam Gamliel, Rabbi, Rabbi Huda, Hillel. Uh, so all, all these people came from Eglon because he stood up once for God's honor. But it was it was hard work, you know. He was extremely overweight. Nevertheless, he did one act, and he he had uh, such illustrious uh, descendants. So that's that's an amazing idea, you know. God is so uh, merciful. Um. So, you know, and things are, depend on the context. In in a generation where there's only idolatry. For a non-Israelite king to stand up for God's honor, that was actually ex extremely righteous in his generation. It wasn't just a, a small thing. Uh, but you know, the problem is if there's a lot of other sins on the plate, you know, so it kind of um, in in the in in the big picture of the uh, total determinant of all the deeds ever ever done. It doesn't necessarily wipe the entire slate clean, especially if there's no repentance. But God is merciful and generous. Uh, so we see in, in verse in verse one that God is angry with the Moabites, who are the most uh, elevated of all the nations mentioned in chapter one, because, uh, you know, because of the, the, what we see from Eglon, even steeped in idolatry, he still stood up for God's honor. Uh, you know, that, that was an incredible capacity for Moab to, to rise up to spirituality. Nevertheless, in verse one of chapter two, they, they become cruel. Once there's cruelty, God doesn't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, God gave them three chances. It wasn't three strikes that they're out by God. It was four strikes and they're out. But the fourth strike was cruelty. And that just messed up everything. H how is God supposed to show compassion if that is the very thing that they are taking away from people? So measure for measure, there was no way God could continue to be generous towards Moab 
even though he wanted to. All right, can you continue the translation, Mercy? Yes, Rabbi. Thank you. Verse four, thus said Hashem, for three transgressions of Judah, I have looked away, but for four, I will not pardon them. For they're despising the Torah of Hashem and not observing his statutes. Their falsehoods that their fathers followed have corrupted them. I will send fire into Judah and I will consume the palaces of Jerusalem. So now it says about King uh, Manasseh uh, of, uh, of uh, Judah that uh, he um, confiscated all the books of Torah and he hid them away or, or, or worse. Um, and um, so he, he on purpose removed Torah from the people from the synagogues. So until that point, God was protecting Judah from guarantees of, of the temple being destroyed. After that point, we see it was the, um, the failure to, to uphold Torah that, that uh, was Judah's biggest sin. We see as long as Judah had Torah, they didn't fall to the spiritual downfall of the northern kingdom. So therefore, it was both a special mission for Judah since, um, since it was obviously very uh, good for them to keep the Torah and, and preserve it. But also, it was like the last chances of the Jewish people depended on Judah because the northern kingdom already failed. So therefore, uh, God is more um, demanding of Judah if there's a failure to have Torah than he was of the northern kingdom. Because the northern kingdom never established the proper uh, form, of, never established the proper uh, form of, of worship of God. Even from the first king of the north, they already had idolatry. Okay, uh, Mercy, can you continue to uh, verse six and onward? Yes, Rabbi. Thus said Hashem, for three transgressions of Israel, I have looked away, but for four, I will not pardon them, for they're selling a righteous man for money and a poor man for shoes. They aspire as they walk on the dust of the earth for the head of the poor, and they twist the judgment of the humble. A man and his father go to a maiden in order to desecrate my holy name. They recline on pond garments beside every altar, and they drink the wine of victims they penalized in the temple of their gods. Yet I destroyed the Amorite from before them, the Amorite whose height was like the height of cedar trees and who were mighty as oaks. And I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from below. I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I led you through the wilderness for 40 years to take possession of the land of the Amorite. I established some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is this not also so, O children of Israel, the word of Hashem? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and you commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Behold, I will encumber you in your place, just as a wagon full of sheaves is encumbered. Escape will elude the swift one. The strong will not muster his strength, and the mighty will not save his soul. He who holds the bow will not stand. The swift of foot will not save himself. The rider of the horse will not save his soul, and the bold-hearted among the mighty will flee naked on that day, the word of Hashem. Now, now consider what we discussed before about the northern tribe. 
what was their the sin known for throughout the book of Kings, uh, throughout the, the book of Hosea? It was known that they were into idolatry and they couldn't go a full generation without having more idolatry. So 200 years of betraying God. And in this here, in this chapter where God says, this is it. This is why I've had enough of them you know, with, with their, with their uh, evil regime. And not once, not in any of these words, does God talk about his honor. Not once does God talk about his service. He starts out with they were being cruel. You understand? So this is amazing. 200 years of disrespect. God, it's, that's among the first three sins. You know, idolatry, one of the first three sins I mentioned. For three sins, I could forgive them. Okay, yeah, they sinned against me for 200 years. But they were cruel. You understand? <laughs> that, that's the merciful God. That's that's the of Harachamim. The the merciful father. Okay. Now you understand. Just imagine, you know, parents invite children over for a holiday. One of the kids is, is in a funk and they just insult the parents all night long. Nobody can enjoy the meal. You just keep insulting the parents, you know. Uh, uh, would you like sauce with your turkey? Yeah, I'm sure it's a cheap sauce, you know. So, you know, constant, uh, constant insults or implied insults the whole night long. And then, and then uh, they were rude to their 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 brother or sister. And then the parent said, hey, cut that out. Finally, the parent wakes up. Not for their sake, not for their honor, only to protect the, the, their sibling from injustice. And that's what God did. You know, if we mentioned before, if, if you offer a thousand sacrifices to God, he has not eaten one of them. But if you give a small, uh, you know, small morsel of bread, you could have saved a, a human's life. So sometimes the, the little we do towards a human, good or bad, is valued higher by, by God himself than, than we can appreciate. And it says it right here. This is God's values. The implication is, 200 years of idolatry is like nothing compared to one, one small portion of one generation of cruelty. You do that, that's it. There's no, why should I, why should I be patient anymore? You understand? It's, God is amazing. It's just, just amazing. Uh, any questions before we continue? Any questions? Remember to unmute while you ask a question or to type in the chat. I, I do have a question. So oh, okay. when it says for three transgressions, would, and if it was idolatry, would those be the first three mm -hmm. commandments of the Ten exactly. Commandments? Yeah, I mean, well, I, you know, it's it, it, all the sins are explicitly mentioned in, in the Book of Kings. You know, we can go through and you know, but I mean, there's no need. We know, um, and it says by Judah, even by Judah, the, the more righteous kingdom, that the, the first temple was destroyed because of idolatry, murder, and adult, adultery, and other forms of immorality. So um, there was, you know, idol worship, bloodshed, and immorality. Those are likely to be the first three. At least, certainly by Judah, it explicitly mentions that. But um, by by the north, also idolatry as well. Um, but when they started to be cruel, that was it. It was over. Thank you, Rabbi. Oh. 
Thank God. You know, we're just we're just mentioning. It. I mean, it's but the implication is so profound, and you don't always hear people talking about it. You know, I I really get riled when when I, I read about uh, people calling the, the the God of the Old Testament is you know being uh, uh, tough or, or you know you know willing to punish, but. As we mentioned before, it's 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 the opposite of the case. It's um, he, he's forbearing for generations of sin against himself, but he doesn't wait a, a full generation if if there's cruelty to humans. And that it's just profound. And well, it's been so long. I think we should go again and read um, a quotation from the Book of Job. Um, let's go to chapter if you have your uh, Tanakh with you this is the stone edition art scroll Tanakh okay. so the book of Job chapter 35 also Chabad.org has a uh, free uh, Masoretic text Hebrew English with optional Rashi uh, commentary as well Okay, from verse 5 uh, through verse 8, 5, 6, 7, 8, chapter 35 of Job, uh, Sefer Eo. Habet Shemayim, Orei, Vashor Shechakim, Gavhu, Mimeka. Im Khatasa Mati Holbo, Rabu Pshaha Mata Stello, Im Sadakta Mati Tenlo Oma Mierha Yikach, Ish Kamoha Rishaha Oven Adam Sipta Seha. Look at the heavens and see, gaze at the skies that tower above you. If you have sinned, how have you affected him, God? Uh, if your transgressions multiply, what have you done to him? If you were righteous, what have you given him? Or what has he taken from your hand? Your wickedness is of concern to a, a, a human like yourself and your righteousness to a human being. Book of Job, chapter 35. So, the good and evil we do only affects people. And the reason that God, it affects God is because he's such a good parent. Like a mother who gets a, uh, a, a bunch of stick figures from her, her child who said, you know, look, I, I just uh, drew this or this or that, you know, and, and the mother says, oh, it's so beautiful, and then puts it on the refrigerator for everyone to see. So it's only that because of the sentimental value. Uh, really, it's not quite up to uh, uh, Rembrandt uh, pr proportions quite yet. Um, but to the parents, maybe it is, you know. Certainly, it's worthwhile to the parent to encourage the child uh, to pursue that, that uh, talent. And, and that's why that's why God wants us to do good. God existed before this universe. So therefore, there's nothing we, we have that creates uh, a direct gift to God. But there's some things we can do that makes God really happy. And one of them is to be merciful to humans whose very lives may depend on a certain given mercy here or there. If we overemphasize offering sacrifices to God, then we miss out on the, the key thing that really connects us to God 
because it has this a a sentimental value in in a sense it, towards from the the creator and that is being merciful to humans being merciful to humans even to animals but certainly to humans uh it it just it really it, god really loves it it's just amazing And, you know, God did not have to put up with wicked generations. You know, he could have said, oh, these people are gonna, going to go too far. Let me, um, you know, get rid of them now. But he didn't. He's always giving them a chance. Maybe they'll repent. Maybe they'll do good. If God made the entire world a giant gray metal box, the righteous would still be righteous and the wicked would still be wicked. But the people in between would be changed. And so for the people in the middle, God made all these opportunities that people could But the goal of the creator towards us is to enable us to receive blessings from him. Now, if you, if you know, for example, that, um, you know, if you get a pet, you're going to fall in love with it. And, uh, you know, it'll be very pain, painful to you if, it, uh, if, if it's over, right? Uh, so maybe you don't want to get a house fly as a pet. You know, a few days later, it's it's already. Uh, you know. Um, more kindness to the animal in your life because it, that relationship is important to you. So similarly, God's actual goal is not that we serve him for his honor. God's actual goal from his perspective is that we enable him to bless us forever. He likes to please people. Did we lose the rabbi? Yeah. I think so. Heard it. All right, we'll just be patient. Or I will. <laughs> yes, we've oh. lost the rabbi. Is that pause? Did it say pause? No, it's just stop. No. Oh, there you go. I pick back the recording so there won't be a big gap in the in the time. Very good. Now, yeah, just to uh, re reiterate, there is uh, 
uh, in case my soliloquy was interrupted there. Uh, so uh, thank God the um, God is merciful. He wants us to be rewarded forever. That's his joy, is that we be rewarded forever. Um, now, it's interesting, and let me, let me uh, take an attempt to start my video. If it starts to get choppy, please warn me, uh, uh, Russell, with a text or something, and um, I'll, I'll turn off the video. Maybe that will prevent another interference, just in case there's traffic in my area. Okay. Video resuming. Yes. Yeah. All right. You look wonderful, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice try. I, I get it. Okay. There you go. All right. So, so God is merciful. He wants to deliver mercy to humans. And as in uh, say for you of the book of Job, chapter 35, uh, if we do something against um, towards God, or even against God, God forbid, it cannot affect them. We do something towards people, it, you know, potentially could save them. So therefore, that is often how people are judged. How are they towards others? And um, yeah, I, I, so I mentioned that God wants us to enable him to bless us. And um I, I forgot the quotation, but I remember my father learning a medrash with me and explaining that there's a punishment for making God punish us. God not only punishes for a sin, he punishes for having to punish people. That's an aspect of the punishment. That's, that's in part the reason why uh, the punishment in, in, uh, uh, in, can, can seem harsher than you would think. In certain cases, uh, you know, and when, when discussing punishment, you have to understand the Jewish concept of of hell is a temporary purgatory to cleanse a person so people could live forever, enjoy, enjoy. Uh, a you know, but in the Torah, thought the a person who paid for his crime, did the time, paid for his crime, that's it. Now he's a righteous person. It's not the eternal damnation system except for uh, epically evil people. But that's not the norm. The norm is if, if a person uh, was unable to repent before they passed on, and if they did not have enough suffering to offset their sins uh, in this world, so therefore then there could be potentially um, uh, a, a stay in, in a in a hell that is temporary but it's it's not the um eternal damnation of some other religions so now that that's from god's perspective god wants us to be good to people and then he can be good to us forever and again the the the, the drama that a human can perish without kindness creates an eternal gratitude from God towards each individual who makes it to heaven. And again, we were talking about 200 years, 200 years of, of disrespecting God, and he doesn't even mention it here in, uh, in the second chapter of Amos. He, he starts out complaining about the cruelty of humans. That, that is wonderful. But, but um, the, you know, the, in the sixth chapter of Perkyavos, you might say, uh, uh, wait a minute, Rabbi, I got gotcha. you. Uh, you know, in the sixth chapter, it says that the, the whole world is created for God's honor, right? Mm -hmm. The whole world is created for God's honor. So, so how does these two things correlate? God want, God's purpose and goal of this world is to please people forever, then why does Perkyavos uh, in chapter 6 end uh, that the whole world's created for God's honor? So that's talking about from the perspective of those who revere God. If you're asking an angel, if you're asking a holy 
sage of the Talmud who was a, the student of the prophets, uh, the B'nai Nevi'im, as mentioned in the Book of Kings, became, in the generation of the Talmud, it became the, the uh, sages of the Talmud. Uh, so when you're talking about an, an angel or an angel-like human, their perspective is the whole world is created for God's honor. God is everything. That's their obsession. That's their, their love is God. But when you're talking from God's perspective, I, I, yeah, again, this is one of the incredible chapters of Tanakh where it's pretty clear. We know there was idolatry and it's not even mentioned. And God fixes his, his, his admonition on cruelty to humans. So it, it, this, this is revealing of God's feelings. And uh, in Perkyobos, everything's created for God's honor is revealing of the perspective of angels and angelic humans. So in other words, it's our aspiration should be the whole world was created for God's honor. Therefore, I'm not as picky about some of the things I want in life you know, yes, there has to be justice. Yes, there has to be mercy. But if I didn't get the exact car I wanted as soon as I wanted it in the exact shade of color that I wanted it, you know, it's, I'm still going to serve God at the end of this, you know, somehow, you know. <laughs> so uh, the whole world created for God's honor is what we should aspire to. The whole world created because of God's love of humans is just the reality of God. That's just who he is. This is why it's called the Al Harahan, the merciful God. Any questions? So Oh, Rabbi, so in saying that, uh, who's speaking God, now? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is that true? Um, yes, it is. Uh -huh. um, so in saying that, then um, God is His perspectives are honored when we uh, when we are merciful. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And in a sense, they're only honored when we are merciful. Right. So that's why he is. Mm, I'm trying to see how. I'm trying to understand it. Okay, I'll, Can you I'll, I'll use say it again? Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll use a parable. Uh, so if, if, if a child, um, when, when they're six years old, makes a stick figure uh, a drawing for, for their, their parents, the parent may put it on the refrigerator for the next two years. Right. If, if a person, when, when they grow up and when they're 20 years old, uh, for, for they visit for the holidays from college, they bring a beautiful print, one of the classics, you know, you know classic uh, artist, uh, the, the parent's favorite artist, you know, a nice uh, reprinting. And the parent may put it in the basement where they look at it once a month, you know, because <laughs> it may be their favorite, but it's just, well, I already got pictures over here. There's a fireplace there. There's a window over there. I can't put it there. So the parent, parent just, you know, puts it somewhere. Right? But the one that the child worked on, ah, <laughs> That's everyone's got to see those stick figures for the next two months, mm -hmm. preferably for the entire school year, only to be re replaced by the same artist's uh, superior drawing when when they've reached a new level uh, of artistic achievement and and now they could uh, uh, color within the lines or something, you know. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, that stick stick figure uh, drawing is, is is still there. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hashem. Okay, so now chapter three is 15 verses long. As long as we have you on here, uh, Shirley, are, are you telling me that you're about to volunteer to translate the chapter three? Is that what you're If thinking? you would like. I, yes. Hey, I can't. Oh. <laughs> a whole world created for God's honor. Uh, I'm trying to achieve that level. I shall wait. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, okay, so we'll, I'll do the Hebrew and then uh, you could do the English. Chapter three mm -hmm. of Amos. Uh, so we're continuing the um, Haftarah that started in last chapter from Vayeshev. And that continues through uh, verse eight. im lachad asipol tipor al pach haretz umokesh en la ayala pach min hadama lachod lo yil kod im yitaka shofar beir va am lo yacharado yacharado im tihira ab ir vadonai lo asa ki lo ya sadonai lohim davar ki im gala sodo ala vadav hanviim Arisha me lo yira, Adnai lohim diber, me lo yinove. Ashimu al armanos, ba ashdod, al armanos, ba eretz mitzrayim. Vimru he asfu al hare shamron, over u mahumos, rabos besocha, ba shukim bekirba, bekirba. Lo yadu asos nehocha, num adnai ha otsrim. Hamas Vashod Barmanos Sehem. Lachenko Omar de Narlahim. Saro Suviv Arts Vahorid Mimech Uzech Vena Vozu Armanosoich. Ko Omar de Narika Shiryat Seal Havroa Mipi Ari Shte Havroaim Ovadal Ozen Kane Yenatslu Bene Israel Hayoshvim Bashamron Bifas Mika Vi Mesek Aris. Shimu Baha Iru, Baha Idu, Bevais Yaakov, Numa de Narlahim, Elohei Hatsavaos, Ki Biyom Pakdi, Ish A, Yisrael Alav, Upakadati, Almiz Bechos, Bais El, Nigdu, Karnos, Hamiz Beach, Vinaflu Lorets, Vikesi, Besa Choref, Al Besa Koyitz, Vavdu Bate Hashen, Vesafu Batim Rabim, Um Adonai. Okay, Shirley, please translate chapter three. One through eight. I <clears> know, <throat> oh, the entire chapter. Oh, okay. Hear this prophecy that Hashem has spoken concerning you, children of Israel, concerning the entire family that I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, you alone did I know from among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will hold you to account for all of your iniquities. Do two people walk together unless they had so arranged? Does a lion roar in the forest if it has no kill? Does a young lion send forth his voice from his lair unless he has captured prey? Does a bird fall in a trap on the ground if he does not have a snare? Does the trap rise from the ground unless it has entrapped? Is a shofar ever sounded in a city and the people not tremble? Can there be misfortune in a city if Hashem has not brought it? But the Lord Hashem Elohim will not do anything unless he has revealed his secret 
to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord Hashem Elohim has spoken, who will not prophesy? Announce atop palaces of Ashdod, Cod, and atop the palaces in the land of Egypt. Say, gather together on the mountains of Samaria and observe the great turmoil within it and the oppressed people in its midst. They do not know how to do right. The word of Hashem, they store up violence and plunder in their palaces. Therefore, thus said the Lord Hashem Elohim, an enemy encircling the land, and he will take your might down from you, and your palaces will be plundered. Thus saith Hashem, just as a shepherd can rescue from the mouth of a lion, but two legs on the cartridge of an ear, two shall be rescued from the children of Israel, who shall dwell in Samaria. But the corner of a bed and the edge of the couch of a couch. Listen and testify in the house of Jacob the word the Lord Hashem Elohim, the God of legions. For on that day that I visit the transgressions of Israel against them, I will avenge the altars of Bethel. The corners of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory will be lost and many houses will be destroyed. The word of Hashem. Oh, wow. Thank God. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, going back to the uh, start of the chapter, um, the the powerful uh, s- statement that um, uh, in, ch- in verse two, you alone did I know um, from among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will hold you to account for all your iniquities. This uh, this is an explanation why so much of Tanakh talks about the sins of Israel. It's not that Israel is is only sinful. As we mentioned, uh, chapter 9 of Proverbs says, don't admonish a scorner. If they were only sinful, you couldn't even admonish them. And it says in uh, chapter 3 of Proverbs, uh, God admonishes the one he loves. But if they never sinned, they, they wouldn't, he wouldn't have to admonish. Uh, so this explains why there, there's been so much suffering um, is that, you know, God expects a certain standard. God gave more uh, privileges. So therefore there's a higher uh, standard expected. You know, for example, if, if uh, two people in college went uh, went to a, a party and one of them acted wild, so people would be more more surprised. Or you know, if if the uh, if the religious person's son was the wild one. there's a certain type of preacher that may make people reject. So therefore it's psychologically speaking, it's, it's, it's understandable that their child may be the rebellious one, but we're talking about spiritually speaking, uh, somebody from a, a, uh, you know, if, if it's um, talking about um, wealth, so the one from the wealthier family, should be able to be more responsible with business than, than the average person. The one from this spiritually wealthy family should be more spiritually responsible than the average person. That's expected. Uh, so too, Israel is expected to be more spiritually responsible. That is the key to their goal, to their mission. 
there were 20 generations in the world without Israel. The, the role of Israel was designed to prevent catastrophe to the world. So never again, God would have to bring another flood. Never again, another dispersion as in the Tower of Babel. But the way the world was going, every 10 generations, there was another catastrophe until Abraham. Then for seven generations, the Medrash describes God coming closer and closer to earth until in the seventh generation, God spoke directly to Moses. Abraham was already a prophet. Isaac was already a prophet. Jacob was already a prophet. But it was different. As God said to Moses, my, my name I did not reveal to them. It was a different type of prophecy. Even though Abraham had extremely high level prophecy. Uh, still, it's not where the prophecy is enduring. For example, we see that uh, when Abraham interrupted the prophecy to go help the angels, he thought they were Arabs, but he went to go help people. Uh, he, you know, in the start, the prophecy mentioned the Midrashic, et cetera, uh, the whole, the whole, you know, at the start of the portion of uh, the era. Uh, so he did not return to the prophecy immediately after he did the kindness for the, the three uh, travelers. Whereas with Moses, if he interrupted, he immediately went back to talk to God. It was just like pausing the conversation and then continuing the moment he had time to speak. And um, Obviously, the system depends on an extremely humble God willing to be paused. <laughs> that's that's the, one of the hardest aspects to fully grasp. But that's a part of who a God is. And if, so when, when the, that happens, so then um, then as, as, uh, as in verse 8, uh, the Lord Hashem Elohim has spoken, who will not prophesy. In verse 9, Ashdod, that, that at the time it was a, a city in the Philistine uh, sector. Uh, now it's a part of Israel. So when we talk about the palaces of Ashdod and the land of Egypt, so we're talking about to the Philistines and the Egyptians. Okay, so in the commentary in the arts world, they bring it down in English. Uh, so the second front, front from the last paragraph of page 165 in the arts world, most in addition. Seder Olam, chapter 22 states that so shall be saved the children of Israel who dwell in Samaria. These are the 10 tribes who relied upon Hezekiah, king of Judah, and upon Judah and escaped with them. So trusting in a good person is better than trusting in, in uh, a sinful regime. The corner of a bed, this teaches that only one out of eight of them was saved. As there are four corners to a bed and a portion of a corner as intimated in the word of Bifas, of, of a corner, is thus an eighth according to Russia. Now, when we were discussing and studying Hosea, we mentioned there were uh, three returns, uh, three returns to um, 
to their brethren mentioned of the northern kingdom. The first return was in the time of Hezekiah. And also we see that in the time of Josiah. And th that's during the, the first, po well, the first immediate, okay, so immediately after the exile of the Northern Kingdoms. So we see a portion of people returned in the time of Hezekiah and a few more in the time of Josiah. Uh, so in the time of Hezekiah, it, it was this, this number here, the one eighth of the Northern Kingdom survived uh, exile by immediately running to Hezekiah for help. Uh, and then the two other times in history where the Northern Kingdoms were restored in part uh, was in the days of, um, of Ezra. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there'll, there'll be a complete restoration of everyone who, who has a potential to return uh, in the days of, of Mashiach. Okay. okay, any questions? Okay, so now at the end of talking about the exile, and uh, verse 14 in chapter 3, for on that day I will visit the transgressions of Israel against them, and I, I will avenge the altars of Bethel, the corners of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. A chapter later, after God defends people against cruelty, and again, cruelty may be the people God is defending, we don't know how righteous these people who are, who are subject to cruelty. Even somebody who's slightly wicked, if they're subject to cruelty, they should be rescued. And we see that it's very unusual that there's a death penalty that's that's um, where the uh, the person uh, being executed is suffers, except in the case of s some sort of horribly evil act. Talmud relates it was unusual that there was a death penalty carried out more than once every 70 years. So death penalty in, in the Torah ideal is supposed to be something on the books to make people think twice about it, but not done too often. So in verse 14, God finally mentions, uh, you know, yeah, you sin against me too, so uh, there's also punishment for that. Verse 15, I will strike the winter house along with the summer house. What does that mean? Okay, so let's look at the commentary. So the left-hand column, page 167, and the most in addition of 12 prophets. Uh, so second uh, from the last line there, I will eradicate the luxuries in which you indulge yourselves. The separate homes for summer and winter that the wealthy among you, particularly the kings and princes, Redak, have built for themselves will be destroyed. The houses paneled with ivory, uh, first initiated by King Ahab and subsequently em emulated by many others, I will remove from your midst. So Israel is, is an incredibly uh, incredible uh, geography. In the, in the north, you can find snow. And in the south, you don't have to go too far south, you could already find desert. So it has every conceivable and there's even some small waterfalls along the way. Every conceivable type of, uh, of terrain 
you know. It's uh, fascinating. It's the kindness of God so that people who are constantly in the Holy Land get, get to enjoy nature. You know, they don't have to leave for foreign countries, which, you know, you want your spiritual think tank to focus on spirituality and not travel. So if, you know, if a Kohen's or a priest's wife really, really, really wants to go on to a nature preserve, so uh, God made it that they have a nice one in, in the country, you know, in, in whatever type of nature they, 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 you know, they happen to like. So the key point is that God creates the capacity. He, he gives a wise commandment and he creates the capacity to fulfill it in a good way and in an enjoyable way. So a person not only has the option to serve God with awe, but he can also serve God with love. Get to that level. But uh, here we have a, a biblical source for bungalows and uh, uh, resorts. It, it's, it's, you know, it's like uh, King Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Under the su sun being um, the uh, parable, the, the key, the key word for uh, something done by humans. Something from heaven, there could always be something new under the sun, or over the sun, you know, above nature. And in, in every generation, God gives new Torah insights. The Torah was created with such depth. As it says in Psalm 36, or in your light we see light. God created new ways to understand the Torah within the Torah itself. So I, later on in the book of Amos, it's, it's fascinating. Even the grammar of the book of Amos gives us insights into prophecy itself. So that we'll learn more about that in chapter seven. <laughs> Stay tuned. So, any questions? Any questions? I have one more. Well, for three questions I can answer you. For a fourth one, I may fall asleep. No, I, I, no. It, it's, it's, it should be real short. Okay. Um, uh, there's chocolate involved for, for five questions. I, I, I can listen to you. Listen. I know. It, it's, a, it's about the summer and winter houses. And the houses of ivory, did you say who they were? Oh, well, I missed was, that. Was a the royal. Ivory. Uh, they yeah, will be I, lost. I, I, so who right. are they? In other words, the, the, the rich, the rich uh, princes of Israel that uh, supported idolatry instead of uh, kindness to people. Oh, they even go up. They even have summer and winter homes. Yeah. Now, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so now re remember the, the, uh, the Medrash description and the commentary discussion in the Book of Kings. Ahab was... was um, an innovator in, of bad things, but he was an innovator. So one of the things he did, he became a mass marketer and of an idol that, that Israel, uh, you know, it, it became known as the, the um, Ahab's, uh, you know, his, his pedigree was as the, the, the uh, distributor of the Asherah idol. Oh my Asherah. God. Yeah, yeah the, the, the tree idol. So, the, like mm -hmm. little tokens, little necklaces of idols, stuff like that, little wooden figurines, all of that was produced in the Holy Land mm -hmm. with the seal of Israel on it by Ahab, the son of Omri. Omri in English. Mm -hmm. And his wife hunted down prophets, so it, it was a bad time, mm -hmm. which which is just amazing, 
that just amazing. You, you reread uh, starting from chapter 17 of, of uh, First Kings. Elijah, Elio Anavi. Amazing. He could, he could face such historically dangerous people. And uh, all the other prophets either hid or died. Yeah. But Elijah, he, uh, you know, see uh, later on, he took on the 250 prophets of Baal. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, they had uh, soldiers as well. So, and and of course, Elio Navi won. So, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's a really good choice to, to um, anoint Mashiach. We don't have to worry about any political controversy whatsoever. Elijah will be able to, uh, you know, be, be protected by God. Any danger in any era in world history, Elijah is highly qualified to be uh, the anointer of, of Mashiach. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Mashiach, since his forefather David was anointed, his anointing does not have to be on the first day in office. What we see from the language of Rambam and Hilchus Malachim, the, the laws of kings, that if there right, raises up a leader of, of, from the house of David who does this and this and this, it, then we can be assured he, 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 he's a, a candidate for Mashiach, in other words. Uh, we, implying that at this point there's been no anointing by Elio enough. Right. So this is because the line of David is already anointed through David. Mm -hmm. There's no need to anoint to get this special spiritual help from heaven that Mashiach will need. If Mashiach is anointed, it's only to you know to uh, to show that this is the one we've been waiting for because uh, in every generation there's hundreds of people who lose their grip on reality and call themselves Messiah and there's different religions where people um, called out to a different Messiah like figure and uh, use that calling out as repentance mm -hmm. use that belief in the other Messiah as repentance and never bothered to achieve, not never were able to achieve service of God through actual repentance because of the heresies associated with uh, false messiahs of, of the past. So therefore, it's, it's vital uh, to promote the opposite of heresy, which is Torah truth. And, you know, Rabbi Tovia Singer is very good at this, you know, also Rabbi Michael uh, Go back also. They, they point out how just mistranslations, mistranslations of, of uh, the Tanakh resulted in many heresies. So simply sharing an accurate translation of Tanakh is, is half the battle. Then you see, wait, this doesn't talk about um, anybody mentioned in, in the New Testament. You know, so what's going on? Any questions? Chapter four. Well, uh, yeah, oh, question? No, well, I was just going to say, so is that why um, some rabbis believe that they're, that the Mashiach is already here? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine. Or could, you know, could be here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but I mean, based on certain midrashim and, and certain sayings of of, um, of Kabbalim, you know, which are you know uh, experts in Kabbalah, and um, it's it's hard to imagine Mashiach is not already in our generation. Mm -hmm. And there have been explicit commentaries by um, big rabbis that said there's certain Mashiach is is a, contributing towards a spiritual progression in our in our generation somehow. Uh, you know, what do you think about that? I uh, yeah, I mean, just on the timetable, you you know, it's not about calculating. Um, you know, th there's a 
on the book's warning in the Talmud, don't calculate when Mashiach is coming. Right. Uh, but we've achieved so many of the prerequisites for Mashiach coming. It's that you have to, I think it, it may be easier to calculate how Mashiach, how is it possible for Mashiach not to come soon? I mean, that, that, that mm -hmm. is, that I think that may be the new, <laughs> the new calculation. Mm -hmm. um, I just, just from the perspective of the Medrash, I, I mentioned this verse, it's in uh, Psalms. So there's a Medrash that quotes the verse from Psalms. Psalm 90. Yeah, Psalm 90. So in Psalm 90, which um, it's called a, a prayer by Moses. Guess who's the author? <laughs> Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu composed it. King David um, added it to Psalms. So on the verse, Samachin of Kim Mosini, Sanu Shino Serena Ra, that is verse 15. Aladdin us according to the days you afflicted us, the years when we saw evil. So there's a measure that explicitly says uh, that. The all the years of suffering in Egypt are removed from the final exile, mm. and all the years of the actual uh, enslavement in Egypt um, was two hundred and ten years. Uh, assuming our current calendars are are accurate, uh, which according to Seder Olam they certainly are, uh, so therefore. Uh, since the era of Mashiach has to complete by the year 6,000, therefore you, you deduct, you go in reverse from 6,000 to 110 years, which would create the, uh, bring you to the uh, Hebrew year of 5790. Our current year is 5782. So just according to the Medrash, you know, it's, I'm not trying to calculate it. I'm just saying the Medrash. <laughs> According to the Medrash on Psalm 90 from Moses himself, uh, the Medrash in Psalm 90, <laughs> okay, we're within eight years of Mashiach. Oh, man. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And now... Uh, and it says in Isaiah, in a time I will hasten it, the Torah And and I I gave conjecture, and I'm not trying to calculate. I'm just saying, what if Mashiach comes before before uh, 2030, which is you know the 5790. Uh, uh, so if uh. Mashiach comes before 2030, how do you explain it? And Lubavitcher Rebbe said Mashiach could come at any time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if, what would be a fulfillment of Bieto Achishana in its time? I will hasten it. In other words, you have to wait for the end of days, which, according to the, uh, so now, one interpretation could be Bieto Achishana. I will hasten it two hundred and ten years because of that. The way that Medrash describes this verse in, in Psalms. Another way is that in the time when I have mercy and bring a sheikh 210 years earlier, at that time, I will also hasten it again. So, you know, the, the, uh, the Midrashim discuss that Mashiach coming is all according to cycles of the Shemitah year, sabbatical yes. year. So therefore, mm -hmm. if God hastens it, it, and since we're within eight years from it, so therefore, it makes sense that the hastening would occur in a seven-year cycle. 
similarly, we find by the um, the uh, the uh, commandment to give lashes. It's called makas uh, The the forty uh, whip lashes. But the the oral Torah from from Sinai says you cannot give more than thirty nine. Because God is merciful, you cannot dish, a human cannot give out full punishment. <laughs> Torah is beautiful. Better. So yeah. therefore, if forty means thirty nine, so therefore the end of days means minus seven years, one sabbatical cycle. Mm -hmm. Since that is the way of uh, judgment of of the uh, reckoning of one sheikh comes. So that means by next year. Oh man. Yes. But 2023, we're, 2023. We're, that, you know. we're in that cycle now. We're in the Shemitah year. So exactly. Is right. that the possible? Yeah. The measure said the year following Shemitah is when Mashiach comes. Does that so, mean the uh, Hebrew year 5783? Or right. 2023. Yes. So it either them together. Right. So it could be the, the, the two prime times for, for Mashiach. And again, we would have we would have to understand why that Medrash is not would not be active if somehow Mashiach didn't come sooner. So calculating when Mashiach comes means you know I'm betting all the horses, you know, selling your life insurance policy <laughs> for that year. We don't do that. That, that's what it means by don't calculate Mashiach, don't, don't sell your life for, for that kind of a gamble. But it's just, it's hard to imagine Mashiach not coming by 2030. And it's easy to imagine Mashiach coming seven years earlier than 2030. Which would be next. We really year. don't need to calculate because he's it's given us everything right, right in Torah. And, you know, yeah, it's just <laughs> we don't need uh, to. Again, it's our time in history. You know, it's it's not a yeah. calculation. It's just trying trying to figure out how does it not occur. You know, yeah, because we're so anxious. Not occur to them? You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I mean, that's cool. <laughs> I, I'm I'm good with that. You know, so. Yeah. Reverend. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, thank God. I mean, you know, it's just yeah. Yeah, but. You know, we trust God. And now listen, after Mashiach comes, you know, suffering eases in the world. Everyone recognizes the right path. Okay. So that means it'll be a greater honor to God. The whole world's created for God's glory, right? God will mm -hmm. like it too, because now he can finally show kindness to, the, to people uh, mm -hmm. at the level he wants to without sin interrupting the process. So it'll be good for God too. But mm -hmm. as a father, God also appreciates even now. Why? Because he, he appreciates the growing pains. Mm -hmm. He understands wisely, you know, yes, they're going through difficulty now, but this time is the proving time. This time is the time I can reward them more than when everybody knows what's right and you know it's it's obviously you have to do what's right if it's obviously you have to do what's right how how, how can you prove the same level of dedication you understand so mm -hmm. therefore people who lived before Mashiach comes may be considered comparable to, to great people in history because somehow they didn't Give, given to despair, they, they, they still chose the right path, even though it was difficult. In the time, of, in the pioneer age, before mm. Mashiach, understand? So we don't fully appreciate what we're in right now. Right, people we're blessed. May, yeah, and we're blessed, and, and people may focus mm -hmm. on the injustices that occur. But mm -hmm. if we look at it from God's perspective, this is a proving time, and, you know, Anybody who just does any bit of good is is already passing aspects of this in, with flying colors. They have to uh, 
uh, observe the Torah for their soul's sake. But as far as um, doing historically good deeds, it's, it's natural in exile to serve God at a high level. It's hard to prove it once everyone's doing it. The Talmud relates, um, how can you determine if a fish is ill? Let's say you, you want to make sure you're going to eat a healthy fish. You don't want to eat something with a disease. So if you see the, the river running and the fish are, are swimming or jumping against the, the flow of the river, they're healthy. If it's just being pushed along, like, like you know, barely able to float, so that's a sign it's sick. So if we are just pushed along by the exile time, so it proves nothing. And in fact, it's, it's even uh, means that when Mashiach comes, they'll just be pushed towards spirituality. <laughs> they don't seem to be using mm -hmm. their fin. <laughs> but uh, if somebody's going against the grain for, for God's honor, for the betterment of humankind, for the sake of mercy, that that is outstanding. You understand? Mm -hmm. and God is taking note of everything that's occurring. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you know Rabbi, I, Yes? No, I'm, th I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. You're going to stop there a minute. No, but, I just but, needed but, to tell you something. <laughs> okay. Right. But it, just imagine uh, a completely righteous family that only becomes religious after Mashiach comes. To a completely righteous family who only became religious after Mashiach comes, but their parents was very righteous in one, just one category of commandment before Mashiach came. So obviously, you know, whether that, that, that family is Jewish or not Jewish, they have a zechusavos of a outstanding spiritual nature from the pioneer spiritual age pre-Messiah, they have one of their forebears who achieved spiritual greatness. You understand? And again, mm -hmm. from our perspective, and, and out of deference to God's honor and love of his commandments, if, if the person is not keeping even one mitzvah, you know, we, we, we cannot, you know, start praising them so much, you know. But I'm just saying from God's perspective, you know, th there's hope. God could forgive everyone if we are sincere and we want to serve him. But the, the key is to start with mercy. Be merciful. Don't be cruel. Because God, we see in, in this very book of Amos, God puts up with 200 years of idolatry not one year of, of cruelty. That's amazing. You had a question you want or a Amen. statement you want to say? No, I just want to make a statement. I thought we were you were you were finished. I just wanted to, to uh, say that uh, you know I really feel for me that Hashem is really giving given us a fresh breath of light and and inspiration through you. Your, your your concepts are different. I mean, some of them are a little bit different and, and harder for me to understand, <laughs> but I just kind of keep grabbing at them. And, and I just feel, I, I just felt like I needed to say that you really are, God really has, gives us a fresh breath of, of light and, you know, and a fresh breath every week. And um, I thank you very, very much for being able to have found you in this class, these classes, they're really beautiful. I've well, never I, heard anybody say, wait a minute, anybody say that uh, about God's love as much as you of loving the enemy, because I guess I always think, well, the enemy, burr, you know, I don't, haven't felt that same way, but you're, you're teaching us, you're teaching us that that is God's way more than, you know, that, then, then I'm seeing and, and trying to, to grasp and learn in, in my synagogue, even. 
it's just like um, well I just know, it, I wanted to thank you well, that's you know and I, I'm sure that, everybody feels that way that's in this class with you uh, <laughs> you're deep you're really deep <laughs> and some things are really hard for to catch on to but gosh it's great God is good Hashem is amazing God is merciful. You know, God had mercy yeah. on all of us in this class. He, he let me be born to the um, the Kiruv uh, outreach uh, a giant of Chicago, Rabbi uh, Leon Eliezer Friedlander. And then he mm -hmm. made me a student of Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik. And then he made me a student of Rabbi uh, Chaim Yisrael Belsky. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, the, of course, all the people associated with it. So, Baruch Hashem, it's, it's, uh, Hashem prepared the class before we even started it. And yeah. in all honesty, I can't really even take credit, even on behalf of my, uh, my uh, teachers, my great teachers, uh, because it's simply in the verses themselves. How often have we simply used verses in context and, and compared to how often have we uh, quoted commentaries? And you look at all the great... Uh, uh, Tanakh teachers, they usually quote more verses and uh, more commentaries than I do. Uh, look at Art Scroll. Right? It's just that uh, we're, we're in a time when people uh, are being destroyed by heresy. And the only thing people don't assume is heretical is the Tanakh. So therefore, simply because for the needs of our generation, you simply have to quote it in context in order to fully give students the, the tools they need to, to fight heresy nowadays. Uh, and, um, and, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's all there in the verses. Look at the context here, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the majority of our class is only quoting verses just, or, or, or doing a comparative study of other verses. Quote some Madrashim, quote some Gomars, a few commentaries, not much. It, it's simply God's word, literally. And we're doing comparative study. So that, that's why I urge people to learn Tanakh completely and review it completely. A simple comparative study will give you that, that element that you seem to appreciate from this class. It's simply God's word. And the reason you may feel it more in this class is because. You're I'm bringing not, it up. I'm, I'm not just. I'm not going away from it. I'm just mm -hmm. focusing on prophecy and more prophecy, because that is how you break down heresy in our generation. <sighs> it's simply the word that's there in every generation of history since the exile began and before. You understand? I. I wish I could claim credit for, 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 for innovations. It's simply right there. It's right there. Right. Uh, anyone else want to wanna chime in? I mean, come on. <laughs> God planned for this, okay? This is, this is simply God's word speaking because we are caring to mention it. And the style of quoting commentaries is great if you're trying to learn one verse. But I'm trying to share the nature of the author of the, of the, the text. Mm -hmm. Who can know the thoughts of God? Anyone who, read, who reads the thoughts of God as he wrote them. God gave us his thoughts. And, and I remember someone... Who, who, you know, they, they were totally fatalistic about spirituality. And that's why they, they couldn't, uh, they, that's why they were, uh, you know, not, they couldn't be, be uh, into, into a religion too much. They just couldn't imagine, you know, spirituality, not sinning, you know. And, and the phrase they used was, was very key. They said, how can a person know the thoughts of God? And they, they described it as arrogant to assume that you know the thoughts of God. I mean, 
you know, when Mashiach comes up, if, if people need it, God, I'm sure, could give us a, a, a prophecy where he says, okay, the following are my thoughts. <laughs> now go and read Tanakh. <laughs> but remember the verse, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. My ways are not like your ways. So God is giving us our thoughts. He gave us our th his thoughts, you know, and they're right here. Just we just have to learn Tanakh. If you learn enough of it, then you can do comparative study. You know, in that context, so it becomes obvious. You know, that's it. <laughs> So it's, it's just the author of the text that you notice because we're, mm -hmm. not, we're not diluting his, his narrative. An average class is one verse and, and paragraphs of commentary. That's an average Tanakh class as you find in a Jewish high school. But if you're in the rough and tumble internet, <laughs> so you want to immediately answer heresy. The only way to do it is, you know, like like in the Tuvia Singer model model of uh, citing a verse to answer uh, to answer a question on, on another verse. But if you do that in the context of a Tanakh class, so now you have not mentioning heresy and then a verse to defend against the heresy. You simply have. Verse after verse after verse after verse of the incredibly loving and merciful God. So it's, it's just like having a concentrated form of, of vitamins, right? That's, that's all you're, you're experiencing in this class. You're just having more of God's work. So there's a very simple uh, workaround, if, you know, after this class is over, if, if you can't wait for the next book. So simply read like three or four Chapters of, of Tanakh right? with understanding, read it with English commentary. You do that and often enough, then you're going to realize wait, but then in, this verse was talked about over there. Then pretty soon, God reveals, uh, you know, lots of that secret pop, pop in your head that wait a second, if he said it here and here and here, that means he loves people for doing that. And there's another verse where, where it proves that even that, you know, so that, that's how it works. So I think you're just getting a more concentrated flow of God's word, you know, simply because we're not using alternative commentaries. Instead of um, so it, it's, it's, it's the word of God himself um, talking to us and, and and that's, I think, why this class is special. Yes, amen, it is special. Yeah, I, and uh, I, you know, now all my great teachers are, are already in the world of truth. Um, ho hopefully I'll have more great teachers looking forward to meeting Elio and other stuff. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, you know, I, I don't know how I could justify this class to them, except that um, if they experienced it with us, I think they would they would make a similar conclusion. Yes, okay, the way you're teaching it is good good enough, mm -hmm. but the classical mm -hmm. way of teaching a verse is with commentaries. You know, you go to yeshiva; it's, it's not taught like this. But again, uh, you know, this is when you're making a video for the internet. You can't just say anything you want. You, know? yeah. you, you have to think about the context. So the best way mm -hmm. is to quote a reliable source. Uh, but, but on the internet, reliable sources are, are insulted by heretics. Uh, so then you better quote the unrefutable un, uh, source more often simple uh, deduction you know? okay so so that's what i recommend for for people wanting to teach Tanakh. just try to quote other verses um in the you know again it was 
based on what a comment by Rabbi Tovia Singer that made me think about this, but just the difference is, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've seen many of his videos, but they, they're great for breaking down a heresy. But they don't teach you the entire Tanakh because he's breaking down the heresy. He's quoting the heresy, he tells you the background of the heresy. But that's not a regular Tanakh class. Regular Tanakh class teaches you Tanakh. You know? And as, as I said in, in the video we did together with <laughs> Rabbi Singer, if when you're starting out, try to be pro Tanakh more than uh, anti missionary, counter missionary. So, you know, we're just starting out, so we have to, we have to learn this way. <laughs> and you learn more of God's word, so you, you get the 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 uh, higher vitamin contact in, in greater uh, doses. I think it's as simple as that. <laughs> Any questions? Again, okay, so um, I guess we'll have to pause here. <laughs> mm, I'm gonna quit asking questions. <laughs> so, so chapter, uh, chapter four next time. <laughs> we'll stop at three or four. Yeah, we will start on four. Any questions, guys? Any questions? Yeah. So it, it, it's it's really cool that there's a grammatical um difference about uh, pro prophecy. Uh, he speaks differently towards God and when he speaks differently towards an angel. So, yeah. All in the book of Amos. Okay. Mm. <laughs> all right. Thanks for learning with me. Uh, again, you can write me at Everfriedlander at gmail.com. And um, uh, well, you know, I, I did not pay Shirley for the comment. <laughs> <laughs> I always get you off track. I'm sorry. No, it's it, <laughs> I, no, it I, I, does. I, no, I'm I'm glad I'm not completely embarrassing my, my great rabbis who you know taught me. <laughs> you did a great yeah. job, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Again, thank you, Rabbi. God stop sharing it with us. So thank God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Last week, Rabbi. Mm -hmm.